From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center. A show about Star Wars, pop culture, and the ultimate adventure, life itself. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm pointing at you like a politician at a debate. I'm Ken Hebsen. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw, and I'm pointing underneath the frame of the camera. And I'm Jennifer Landa. They're doing yard work outside. <laughs> we all got something special going on. <laughs> we do indeed. This is a breaking news from a long time ago episode. We're going to catch up with the Star Wars news. We decided to approach the news this way. And I'm actually excited about this. Not that Star Wars news isn't always fun and exciting, but uh, sometimes it can get a little mundane. Sometimes you get an explosion news. So we're going to play Star Wars catch up, Star Wars news catch up today. Uh, before we dive into that, uh, we want to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash force center. Over 180,000 titles, and I'm sure more by now to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Uh, we are recommending a book right here, right now for you to try out on us, Dark Disciple by Christy Golden. It's a book that is uh, rising in the charts again, much like Ventress herself, Back to <laughs> Life. It's a great book. Christy is a wonderful author, a big Star Wars fan. Download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash force center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash slash Force Center for your free audio book. That A is out of the way. Joseph, we have the other big A. Around yeah, we do have another big A. It's asks. Uh, we have been asking for a while for your help growing our Patreon. It is our most uh, solid means of support over the years, and we appreciate that so much. So we want to pay uh, special attention to it. Uh, Patreon is now set up to have free members and paid members. We were trying to get to 400 paid members and we kept dancing up and down but we've been above at 402 paid patrons for a little while now so we're going to unlock the goal that we set for 400 paid patrons which is that we're going to do a new commentary for one of the films in the skywalker saga and you uh, as a patron uh, a paid patron are going to decide which film that we do uh, just before we hit record we launched a poll on our Patreon page. So if you're a paid patron, you should see that uh, popping up where you can go vote for one of the nine Skywalker Saga films. In the past, we have done commentaries for A New Hope, The Phantom Menace, and The Last Jedi. We're open to redoing them because, hey, a lot has happened since 2017, as I think is the last time we recorded one of those. Yeah. So that poll is yeah. going to be up until May 6th at 11.59 p.m., so uh, while you're just uh, uh, partying away like Ewoks and Gungans at parades and celebrations during May the 4th weekend, uh, be sure to check out that poll starting anywhere from now uh, to May 6th and vote on which movie you'd like us to see us do a new commentary for. Lovely. Exciting. Uh, love getting back. This is going to be done virtually. The last time was on my couch, which I still have that couch. You're, you're, you're both more than welcome to sit on it. I just don't think we can record with two chihuahuas in our faces the entire time. <laughs> uh, so that'll be fun. Uh, thank you for the support. Um, yeah, Joseph's uh, very right. In these uh, changing digital media times, having something steady like Patreon, not just terms of financial support, but the community mm -hmm. is very valuable to us there. Uh, before yeah. we uh, get to the news, yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, I just also wanted to mention that we've got a live stream as well on Friday, right. April 22nd. 2 p.m. Pacific. We're going to be uh, getting all excited for the very end of uh, Bad Batch on an episode. So it'll be a last time to uh, think mm -hmm. about what might happen next. Uh, we're also going to do a quick show and tell with some uh, toys that we got. Ken actually uh, drove over uh, to my apartment. Jennifer met us here and we were all in person in the same place for uh, almost five whole minutes. It was amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. It uh, was fun. Yeah. Um, uh, in a photo to commemorate. I th I'm very glad you did that because mm -hmm. it, it could be another three years. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, L.A. is big, kids. L.A. is big. <laughs> uh, before we get to uh, our breaking news catch-up, some great stuff to get into today, talking about Daisy Ridley, talking about the Acolyte, uh, a lot more. We should say right now, Joseph, we should say, we not, the Outlaws trailer's out, the video game mm -hmm. that comes out in August. We're going to uh, take our time with that as well. We're playing catch-up. So we're going to keep playing catch up. Uh, the trailer looked fun. We'll get to that in a bit. But before we do all that, we'd like some life and Star Wars adventures catch up. This is our chance to uh, uh, catch up and explain how Star Wars maybe found our life or maybe it didn't. Uh, Jen, <laughs> did Star Wars find you? Well, it found me a few weeks ago. I think I shared that I went to Disneyland and we went on the Smuggler's Run ride, mm -hmm. the Millennium mm -hmm. Falcon ride. And I, I was talking with my husband about it. He's like, yeah, you're very transparent on your face. You show your emotions a lot. I was like, no, I... 
I don't. I'm I, I'm pretty good at covering that. He goes, no, no, no. Look at this photo of <laughs> of you on the Smuggler's Run ride, and I look terrified. He literally captured this as I don't know. There was an announcement about what we were supposed to be doing, and I remember getting very scared. Um, I was trying not to show it to my two children, who we have pictures of them. They look very happy. I look like I'm <laughs> actually in the Falcon with I don't know who piloting because it's a little <laughs> terror on my face. So that was and I actually had a nightmare about it last night. Smugglers run. So a lot of the Millennium Falcon has been in my life lately. So did the actual ride itself once it started or happened scare you or was it just the concept of it all? It was pretty scary for me. Yeah. Okay. Because it's, it's like such a small space. Okay. okay yeah. It. And then I was a an engine an engine no not the engineer I was a person the gunner, gunner? right yeah. so I was like and my four year old was a gunner so I was just like yelling at at her and my eight year old was piloting. Fire. What's up? Hit the button! Hit the button! Like so I was able to focus on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was terrifying. Uh, I was okay. not expecting yeah. that. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. It's a lot oh, of bumps, sense. a lot of screaming. You know, yeah. a lot of judgment from Hondo, you know? Yep. <laughs> yes, right. It's very realistic, too. I mean, oof, yeah. I, I just, get a little uh, motion sickness. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, see, it's all adding up to make a lot of sense. Not that it didn't in, at the beginning, but I, I thought maybe it's just anxiety over the rules. Because when you're the engineer, the gunner, there's a lot of things you got to do. And it's like you feel you got to take notes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, no. It's the motion sickness. <laughs> <laughs> that was my adventure. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, good one indeed. Mine was uh, pretty simple. I, I nothing. Um, uh, though I will say this: I've started reading the uh, was the living uh, the living force book, mm. the the, the, the oh. latest uh, one uh, from um, uh, Jonathan uh, Jackson Miller, right? Um, I'm, and I'm I, our relationship with Star Wars books. I want to say it's changed, but we're just we don't cover him on, on the channel, so there's a little less pressure to read them or read them fast or you know take notes. And all that stuff. I'm just kind of reading this book. Um, uh, about uh, 60 pages in, and I'm just having fun, and it's good, and I and I love uh, spending time with this pre Phantom Menace uh, world with the Jedi Council, and and I think it's a great book so far. That that's been kind of fun uh, to kind of reconnect uh, with the Star Wars book again for me. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've said this other places. We sometimes get questions. We just we're having a hard. We fell behind on the books. It's hard mm -hmm. to keep up. We spent. Uh, they were when Ken and I were reviewing them a lot, uh, like kind of in, in the in the you know uh, a lockdown era and that mm -hmm. probably the most work intensive episode, and on also because it just it's not as big publishing just isn't as big as on screen M most work that we put into the episodes for the least amount of views. So on a just real practical level, we yeah that's why we're not doing the the book reviews yeah. as much anymore. Maybe we'll do a special one or not. But I'm real excited about the Living Force. I've been trying to get caught up on High Republic. And I think I might shift over to the Living Force because it's just such a Phantom Menace 25th anniversary celebration, you know, thing. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely mm. think you'll like it. So yeah. there's that. I've also been rewatching the light and uh, the the Industrial Lights and Magic doc, uh, mm. uh, Light and Magic, so and, and and join. It's it's so good. It's so good. Uh, shout out to Larry Cast and putting that thing together with a bunch of wonderful people. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun revisiting that too. So that's yeah. great. The magic of Star Wars. But you, sir. Yeah, Avengers. Star Wars. Uh, yeah, Star Wars Adventures. It, it's it has been Doc City. Uh, I think uh, for uh, all of us, Jennifer making documentaries. Ken, <laughs> you and I watching them. Um, I'm working hard on a lot of film stuff on uh, short films, on uh, working on trying to put together a feature. And boy, does it help to, to hear what other people go through <laughs> trying to make that, uh, make that kind of stuff. And there's a there was a phrase that I was I'm always like, I love that phrase. I think Ben Burt said it. And it's like, I'm just going to Google it to make sure that I'm quoting it right. It's the uh, this phrase films aren't released. They escape. Mm -hmm. um, and I Googled it and realized it's from a doc on the uh, disc of Attack of the Clones. And I rewatched the doc and it's so good. It's a lot about sound effects, but it's also like about the process, the entire process of making Attack of the Clones. There's a thing at the end where they're they're kind of done with the film and they're t somebody's talking to George. I think Ben is like, well, now it's just up to the audience, you know, and George mm -hmm. is like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's so real it's so good uh absolutely love it so that's that's been one of my big star wars adventures also got tickets to see the phantom menace in a theater with other mm. humans uh i can't amazing. wait to see that uh I, I specifically uh i changed some life plans so that i could see it on a night where a bunch of tickets were already sold because i want to have the experience of seeing phantom menace in the theater with a bunch of people 
who like the movie and want to see it and want to cheer for it. Like, uh, mm. it's just amazing how, how time changes things. Hmm. I've got to make a note to do that. Got to yeah. make a note to <laughs> yeah. buy tickets. But that's it for me. Right. So uh, right. uh, ready to dive into some news? Let's dive into some news. Joseph, you've pulled some wonderful stories as we play catch up. Let's do it. Yeah, and as Ken said, uh, we we I was gonna uh, I was gonna start pulling notes on that uh, the Outlaw trailer. I know people are really excited about it, but there's so much to talk about from old Empire magazine, uh, from their interview with Daisy Ridley, and all their coverage of the Acolyte. Uh, we decided we'd like to focus on that. So first, we're gonna talk about Daisy Ridley takes on the Empire magazine. Uh, gathered up some quotes uh, from great coverage of uh, this article from Star Wars News Net. So that's where most of this uh, comes from. So the big sound bite about Star Wars in this, uh, this uh, big sprawling interview with Daisy Ridley is that uh, she said that she is expecting to read a script for the new Jedi Order film a month from now. So to be clear, that is a month from whenever she did the interview. So that is uh, open for interpretation on the timeline. Uh, Daisy Ridley specifically said about the film, I know the story beats, but other than that, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I'm reading a script next month. So, Jennifer, how do you feel about that quote? How do you feel about this timeline that she's either reading it right now, read it a week ago, uh, going to read it in the next couple of weeks? Uh, does this give you confidence that the the monolith of this new Jedi Order movie is moving along? It's interesting to say... A month from now, I'm going to read a script. Like how, I guess my biggest question is, is she a producer on the film? Because that can sometimes happen. That determines mm -hmm. like how far along this script is. This could be like a first draft if she's a producer. This could be, you know, close to maybe the shooting script. There's, there's so many different stages that a script goes through that I don't know what to make of this other than mm -hmm. this movie is far off. Like I'm not going to even really think about this too much because so much could change. Um, and unless maybe they start filming next year, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Script reading. Yeah. Script Baby's reading without needed. knowing, yeah, without it, that's a real big difference between I'm reading the first draft and I'm reading the shooting script that everyone else has signed off on is right a real right. big difference, yeah. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And how are you feeling about this quote and what it means for the timeline? Uh, I did, I looked up, I want to shout out to uh, Alan Voivod of Star Wars 7x7. I check on his stuff often, uh, great little show there, Daily Dose of Star Wars Joy. Uh, and he had, uh, she was shot a film in February, March, she was interviewed during that time. And you're right. It's the script. so it's like right now. She's got it this mm. morning with a cup of coffee, tax day, <laughs> and a script is what I, I predict. Um, and so that's kind of exciting. I, I agree with you, Jen. That what version of the script or what all that stuff is is uh, you can get lost in the weeds. But I, I'm I'm I, I've said this before, especially when with this all launched ten years ago, Force and everything. When I know that there's like new Star Wars out there. And, and that now that means concept art or pitch meetings or you got go picture, all that stuff where they're on set. I get really excited in a nerd chill kind of way of just like, <laughs> I don't even know it yet, but it exists. And, and, and I and I enjoy that. So the fact that, again, she's I'm sure, uh, you know, a, a FedEx truck is coming up her street right now to drop off the script like it was 1997. <laughs> uh, that's it's kind of exciting in itself. Uh, we'll talk more about, uh, you know, uh, the whole film and everything like that. But uh, I like that we're at least at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, this kind of tracks timeline with there, there was supposed to be going to be this uh, hopeful delivery uh, before this, the writer's strike. And you know, it's been a little bit of time after the writer's strike. It seems like maybe a couple drafts, maybe some polishes. Um, but just hearing the forward movement, if it is, this is the first draft and she's seeing it, you know, reading it the same time as is uh, Kathleen Kennedy, or if it's getting closer to a shooting script. For me, it makes me feel like, well, the foot is on the gas and this movie is moving forward. It isn't in the pitch phase or, you know, it isn't in the outline phase. It's there's a script. My hope is that they've got their foot on the gas for the Mandalorian and Grogu. And I I have no evidence for this. I just kind of think it makes sense for the industry. I think they're going to try to hurdle that toward a release next year mm -hmm. in 2025 because it's been quite a while without mm. films. Mm -hmm. The Mandalorian Grogu has a machinery set up to it. You don't want to let the um, Mandu Grogu hype die off too much with too long from them away from screens. So I think it makes sense that they're really moving fast on this, uh, which uh, I continue to hope the new Jedi Order film is the next one that gets made. So 
if they can get a script approved and start pre-production this year, film 2025, then they're be on track for a 2026 release. And and for me, if if Mando and Grogu comes out in 2025, and then a year until the New Jedi Order, I, I do think that I don't think Star Wars is ready uh, to be up to two movies a year. And I know other people feel very strongly that give me as much as Star Wars, give me a Star Wars movie a month. I get it. But for mm-hmm. me, for like the health of Star Wars and, and not oversaturating the movie marketplace, I, I a movie a year is, is great as it returns. So those mm-hmm. are kind of, those are, that's where my mind goes and my hopes go. I, yeah. It's all hopes though. I, I'm, I, this was whispered to me recently and I had missed the story. The, the last investor day, they said Mando Grogu was May 22nd, 2026. Mm. Uh, I, he, he, really states move. So I'm not confident that that will be it. Uh, I'm, I hadn't, uh, you just made me think of that. I remember having a conversation with someone last week and I was like, I hadn't heard that. Well, look, but if I'm going to have hopes yeah. dashed, I like them to be dashed immediately. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> for it's a variety deadline, so it's more than just a rumor. Uh, but mm. yeah, I okay. missed that completely, too. Wow. 2026. Okay. So this yeah. would. So this yeah. is like 27, mm-hmm. 28. Yeah, that's kind okay. of why I was like, yeah, all right. Text me when when it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So mostly what this means is after she's read the script, anytime she tries to promote another film, she will be repeatedly asked if Finn is in the movie or yes. not because she's read the yes. script. So that's yeah. really the breaking news here. Daisy yeah, Ridley really- will be asked about Finn more often. <laughs> Every red carpet, <laughs> she'll be asked. Yep. <laughs> All right. We will we will mm. move along from the old release date dance uh, yeah. to this great discussion with Daisy Ridley to some uh, more of the kind of uh, emotional depth on her journey. She discusses the journey of playing Ray as a young woman compared to now. Uh, she says, coming in a bit more eyes wide open, I suppose I feel more like I'm owning it. I suppose I owned it the first time. Basically, I'm an adult now. I certainly did not feel like an adult at the time. She means of, of Force Awakens. Uh, obviously, personally, things have changed. And professionally, I've had lots of other experiences. And so I definitely feel like it's a different thing this time. There's just a lot of joy with me in these films. Honestly, if I wasn't excited, I wouldn't have done it. Feels like a great thing to be a part of. I suppose the truth is Star Wars will always be the first thing that is connected to me in my career. It's something I'm aware of, but it's also not something I feel is a difficulty. I feel very privileged to have done that role and obviously will continue to in the business way of things. I'm then lucky to have to have been able to go and do other stuff because of those films. So I don't take any of that for granted. I want to be a working actor. That's my thing. And I'm doing it, and it's pretty effing great. <laughs> so, Jennifer, how do you feel about her attitude toward uh, uh, being a part of Star Wars, about the reality uh, of changing perspectives of age? What mm-hmm. What do you get from all this? Mm-hmm. I think it, it it reflects the day and age that we're in in terms of the industry. So, back in the day, it used to be death to do TV, to do a superhero movie. Um, it really could limit your career, which is, you know, why Harrison Ford didn't want to be a part of Star Wars and well, one of the reasons. So nowadays, people recognize that being a part of a franchise is a very smart thing. It gets your name out there in social media. You're trending. You have brand recognition. So she's playing the game smart, and she's seen that it's probably helped her get some more opportunities as an actor. Um, and it's like, how are you going to say no to to more acting opportunities and more money Like <laughs> when you want to be a working actor? Of course. I'm sure they're very nice to her. It's a very, you know, win-win. She sees kids dress up like her character. Like, why not? Of course. She's excited and joyful to be a part of it. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, Ken, what are your thoughts on these quotes? Uh, I love this. I love where she's at. And God, yeah, Jen, you got me thinking here of just like, I'm, yeah, the, the deal now that she's probably signed is probably different than the one at 21 22 years old when she had mm-hmm. one headshot and a bartending yeah. job uh, uh but moving beyond the business side of it there just to where she is i mean yeah this is uh, you know over a decade well over a decade we're almost like 15 years for this process from then to now for her she's gotten married recently i did that was kind of oh, on the down low yeah. she yeah yeah it was on down yeah she, she's been married she's doing all these projects she wants uh I think she's grown as a performer too, as as, as well. So all that going to uh, this is pretty bleeping great. And uh, coming back to this, uh, I'm excited. One of the big things I'm excited about for this project is that we get to go forward in the Star Wars timeline in a relatively uh, 
you know, close amount of time to when it's ended with nine, right? And that's the thing we never got with Return of the Jedi. Uh, we didn't go to episode seven with, uh, you know, a 40 year old uh, Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill, uh, and 50 year old Harrison Ford. We didn't get that chance. Um, and so we had a different way to approach the continuation of the story in, in 2015. Now, Again, still 10 years or so, whatever. But, like, we have an actor who's like, yeah, I want to dig into this character with my new life perspective and see what I can take from it. That's exciting stuff. All exciting. Yeah. No, I, I really agree with that. And I think you, but all of the prequels are designed as coming-of-age stories. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of this, we get a lot more storytelling now in, in publishing and some in television. But, you know, a lot of it has been... Uh, our, our main characters become fully formed. And then we, we've been treated to stories of... And now they're... <laughs> significantly older <laughs> right, right, right and you know been been through some hard knocks and the idea <laughs> of spending some time with the main main star star wars character kind of in the prime of their journey um is is fabulous and and i don't reading this I, it was just we always talk about star wars about like the ideas of star wars are valuable because strip away the the laser swords and the, the you know diamond moon serpents and all the fun pulp stuff and the, these are real life things that can affect us too. So it's always kind of powerful to me when I see one of the performers in Star Wars almost feeling like they're uh, talking about the themes in Star Wars. To me, like I read this, mm -hmm. and Jennifer, I think you're right to think about the um, the industry, but I also feel like we know Carrie Fisher pulled Daisy Ridley aside and gave mm -hmm. her all this advice. We know Daisy Ridley had the benefit of looking back on Harrison Ford's journey you know i mm -hmm. think of that great moment i think it's in the empire of dreams doc where there were the interviewers asking harrison ford how he felt once he got the once the star wars movies were popular and he has that great wait let's get to work you know like <laughs> oh, he yeah, had right, that awareness right. even then of like right, okay i've become right. this popular from this genre thing i'm going to parlay that into doing whatever i want acting wise that's so what daisy really is talking about of like have your mm -hmm. head screwed on straight about the value of genre Mm -hmm. And uh, and how that can lead to a thriving acting career like it did for Harrison Ford. And and I'm going to do that. So there's this like kind of great uh, tale of benefiting from the generations that have come before, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. she is the in the character of Ray in the story is benefits from the wisdom of the Skywalkers. And it feels like in real life, the actor has benefited, you know, from the life experiences of the performers. Mm -hmm. I also just think that the the there's this great energy of acceptance in the way that she's talking about it like yep i'm not fighting being like no matter what i do for the rest of my life i will be ray skywalker and yeah. i accept that and i'm also going to be other things and i accept that that's external like mm -hmm. when other people see me that's that's the main way they think of me but that mm -hmm. doesn't need to dictate my inner life i don't know it's all it all feels very wise and zen and i'm looking forward to what this real human being Daisy Ridley has been through in bringing all of this uh, wisdom and, and uh, sort of Star Wars themes to the character of Ray, who's going to be a similar age, having gone through similar journeys is mm -hmm. what Daisy Ridley has with the trials of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I really like what you're saying about this stuff here too. And Jen, you, you, your, your excellent point of like the industry changing and TV used to be, you know, unless it was a movie of the week, you weren't, you, know, you didn't do film and TV together. Like that was a sign of either you were going up or you're going down in your career. And the genre stuff like you're touching on, Joseph, which was definitely part of, I think, what was going on where you uh, have to move behind the, the beyond the sci-fi stuff. We're at a different spot now. It's also financially a good idea, right? That story it went around of Tom Holland's first bonus check from Spider-Man getting sent to the wrong Tom Holland <laughs> was eye-opening. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I don't bring that up to be cynical about money and they're just doing it for money. But yeah, it, it's valuable to your career to do this stuff. But also I I think a performer like her now, it isn't just coming back to the role and let me do the check. Again, cynically, uh, cynical people might think that, but she's going to be like, yeah, you, you, get me back to do something that I want to do with this character and explore this character with who I am now. I, I think that's exciting and a good change in the industry. Mm -hmm. No, I really agree. And I think it uh, leads into uh, the final uh, quote uh, from this uh, Empire magazine article that I wanted to talk about. She talks about the decision to play Ray again. 
She says, it wasn't a difficult decision. I didn't say yes right away. Uh, Kathy was like, take as long as you need. It was actually really funny. On the way there to meet uh, Kathy and Kennedy, I was on the phone to my best friend. And he goes, oh, my God, Days, imagine if they're doing a Ray TV show. <laughs> and I was like, nah, we're literally just going for breakfast. And then I called them. I was like, you will never guess what. Uh, why wouldn't I do it? Yes, they have been a divisive, but also they bring a lot of love and joy to a lot of people. It feels pretty amazing to be able to continue a character like, can I even remember how to play her? It's an interesting challenge as an actor to come back to something and try to figure out what's changed for me and what's changed for her. So, uh, Ken, a lot of great thoughts in there as well as a, as a funny story and, and great to know that uh, Daisy Ridley's best friend is also a Star Wars super nerd wondering yeah. about Ray television shows. Yeah. Um, uh, so feel free to, to pull out whatever you'd like, Ken, but I'm also just really interested in the number of times in this interview that Daisy Ridley seems to talk about actively choosing joy Mm. about the sequel trilogy and in mm -hmm. reflecting that it brings joy to people. So what are your thoughts? I, I love that because she says, you know, hey, they've been div divisive. And, and that's a truth, whether we like that or not, or what side of we're on the debate we are in the Star Wars culture. Or, yeah, that's a truth, right? That's a truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw, st I was on, I, I blocked my first person on threads uh, this weekend and I didn't know them. I just, they had reshared a, a pretty crappy take on what uh, episode seven should have been and what we were lost, uh, what we lost. And, and, you know, so it's still out there, but for her to be like, yeah, but the, that, that's part of it. But the reality is, is like you said earlier, the the, the young fans dressing up as Ray or always be, be in this character, you, you can let that uh, control you. And there's some downside to that. Um, or, or you can find, you know, reasons to keep going with it. I, I don't think we'll ever see Adam Driver back in Star Wars. I hope I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. But there's been quotes uh, of him going like, oh, yeah, you know, I see little kids dressed up as Kylo Ren. It's great. Like. I think he's sometimes painted as a as a grump. He's serious and intense, but uh, he seems like a really uh, good dude who just wants to do other things. He's in a different spot with this, but he still recognizes the power of this, uh, and I think she does too. And I th I think that's great. And 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 you know, we're at a different time where it, it 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 she comes out at London and 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 an entire arena stands on their feet for her it's it's different than what you know it took ahmed 20 years to get back as we know unfortunately mm -hmm. so it's a different time in that re regard as well so choosing joy is not easier but it's important and valuable here especially for that mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. jennifer how do you feel about the, the choosing joy or anything else in that quote she's very well adjusted and i think part of it is she deactivated her uh, instagram account i believe in mm -hmm. the force mm -hmm. awakens i think that's when that happened mm -hmm. because she was getting so much backlash and hate and all this stuff she may have a private instagram account who knows but i think separating herself from social media was a very smart idea because i see some performers musicians actors who just can't help themselves and it because they are real people and i think yes we can say oh this person has all this money and they're a wealthy celebrity blah 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 they are still real people who feel those slings and arrows right and so i think you know, she probably has a good therapist who told her, separate yourself from that. So she can just focus on living her life and experiencing that joy that you're talking about, Ken, being able to receive that from the fans, being able to do see kids dressed up as her character. And time heals old wounds because she's had some time now to reflect back on. It's mm -hmm. not like she's like actively in it, you know, hearing all this chatter. Now she's hearing all the great things and all the, the wonderful impact that her character had. So I think it's the right time. And I think she's done a lot to, to protect herself, which that's wonderful, wonderful, because we see that not happening with some performers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and she is back on Instagram. She, she took she? a long break. Yeah, yeah. She came she's back like, yeah, a, a, while, a, a while ago, oh, um, God which, bless I, which I actually think uh, only um, underlines the point you were making, Jennifer, about being... <laughs> Well adjusted, you know, because there are those yeah. oh, yes, celebrities that are just like they're like people keep asking Dakota Johnson about various memes, and she's like, "I I barely know what a meme is. I'm not yeah. I'm not on that thing. I saw a T-shirt uh -huh. of myself, and I don't." Yeah. And people are like it's a meme, and Dakota Johnson's like, "Okay, I don't know." Uh, but mm -hmm. it, it, I don't know. There, there's something to me about the way she's talking about. She, yep, I acknowledge they're divisive. I'm not in a fantasy land. But I'm not going to be chased away from them. I think that's I, maybe that's what I'm mm. uh, responding to. Maybe reading into. Uh, I don't know. But I just kind of feel like that's what we need. Like, 
there's uh, there's uh, you know there's always going to be taste thing there's always going to be people who like you you don't do not have a negative bone in your heart and you don't enjoy the sequel trilogy that's fine no yeah. big deal right mm -hmm. but so much of this is generational and we've seen this we know this from music to saturday night live to every interconnected story you know there's people who don't like new star trek because they like old star trek doctor who and the same thing with with star wars it, it goes it, there's going to be people you know 20 years from now they're going to be old grumps who hate everything new marvel because it was you know in infinity saga is the only good Marvel. like it's it's uh it, it, it so, so much of it just isn't about the people. It isn't about the work. It's just a reality that, mm. A, there's generational change. Hateful people are going to be hateful, and they want to chase people away from social media. They want us to not enjoy the things we enjoy. Mm. And to me, it feels like the antidote to that is go, it's real. I'm not going to deny that there are people who, who hate this, but I'm not going to let that stop me from focusing on the joy and uh, it, it seems really powerful to me that that seems to be what she's doing of like, I'm going to focus on the joy and that's yeah. make sure that the hateful people don't win and control what we talk about. Yeah. Yeah, she, she came back on in 2022 to Instagram and she said, coming out of social media hibernation, refreshed, recharged and ready for what I'm calling my year of yes. Mm. And I just, yeah, it just seems like there's even a photo of her like, you know, I just think that she's yeah. she's grown up. Like she's an adult. She's in charge of her life and her destiny. And she's had some great, great films that have come out since Star Wars. Like her career is thriving. And so mm -hmm. yeah, it's 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 she's ready. She's yeah. ready to come back. I think metaphorically the character of Ray Skywalker is is gonna be on Instagram in the new yeah. order film. <laughs> metaphorically, not right. literally. And be okay with it. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to start to uh, talk a little bit about the Acolyte. Hell, we're going to talk a lot about uh -huh. the Acolyte. This was one of those huge Empire magazine, uh, it, like a Star Destroyer firing out uh, probes to find the Rebel base. Tiny, tiny little mini articles. Uh, so I once again uh, relied on the coverage, the gathering up the details from the Star Wars News Net site. Uh, there's a lot in here. We're not getting to everything. Uh, we're talking about a lot. There's so much in here. Uh, so we are cherry picking as we go. But here's where I'd like to start. Uh, Leslie Headland had a great quote about the overall story of the Acolyte. She said, it's one story with several reveals and new clues and new information each episode. It's not just a mystery that you have to find out. It's not unlike Russian Doll, uh, which is her uh, show she co-wrote. It's almost like a spiral. It digs deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, can the show has been described as a mystery show. Uh, it, the creators described it that way, but I think a lot of us uh, uh, fans are really running with that. What are you hoping for in a mystery show in general and specifically a Star Wars mystery show? Is there a, a risk that we're over-focusing on a genre label here? I hadn't thought about this to, to you. Pulled this quote of, I'm excited for a mystery show in Star Wars. We'll talk about the genre thing. But I, I hope everyone responds to each mystery with a measured leveled approach <laughs> to what each week will bring and what the mystery will be. Uh, I'm slightly kidding because have fun. Who's CX2? We'll find out, but it's fun to wonder aloud and on a podcast and on a show. So I'm, I'm excited about the mystery. The genre thing is interesting because that's such a, a Star Wars thing. We know it. We've discussed it for years here. It, it, Star Wars is a genre stew and there's some that emerge um, more than others. And I... I've also run into some people who are like, I just w w hate that Star Wars does the genre thing, like locks itself into this is a Western, this is that. I don't think it's ever locked itself into one thing. I don't think, if anything, the, the one thing it locks it into is you know, a hero's journey or something. I'm not even sure that's 100% true. It's just the overall vibe. It's a myth. It's what we're doing here. Um, but again, that's that's cynical. I, I, I love the idea. I, I love that uh, you're going to want to tune in. Uh, every week. I, I, I love that there's characters already that I'm starting not to trust and I've just seen a photo of them, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't <laughs> know if we've, to what degree we've got that before in Star Wars, in this modern mm -hmm. age, and in, in, in all of Star Wars. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Really excited about that. Yeah. I, I want to follow the rule of really listen to what the creators say. 
mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because they're the ones who wrote it, so they know what it is. So I I want to take the mystery label with a grain of salt. I don't think it's going to just be an Agatha Christie. I don't think it's going to be like, you know, right. who stabbed this Jedi, you know, with what kind of lightsaber in what room, you know? <laughs> I, I don't think it's just going to yeah. be a, a one and done who done it. And it feels like that's what <laughs> Leslie Headland is trying to get a, a head of here. Yes. I, yes. I over focused on the espionage label of Andor. And mm. I, I got myself excited right. for I that's wanted a, a, you know, like the, the show The Americans, which did have a overriding story, but it really was like every episode they had to do something, some horrible, stressful mission that they were mm -hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And the first season of Andor was much more to me like a, a slow boil social political thriller. It wasn't like Cassian's on a different espionage mission every episode. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to roll my own sort of expectations of what does that genre label uh, mean uh, back. Um, my other thought was, you know, I'm a deep lover of Twin Peaks. And uh, the first season of Twin Peaks in particular does have this central huge mystery of who killed Laura Palmer. Uh, mm -hmm. But as the, the creators, David Lynch and Mark Frost, always say, like, that was our opening into the town, into all mm -hmm. these other sub mysteries. In the pursuit of this one big mystery, we find out these people are having an affair. This person is hiding this truth. And mystery is a device to dig deeper and deeper into communities and go, who really believes what? Why do they believe, believe that? How far are they willing to go? And so my sort of realigned hope is that it's more like, yeah, maybe there's one central mystery. But the point of the mystery isn't the answer of who did it. It's to dig into what are all the secrets being kept in, in mm -hmm. what is what do people truly believe in this time of, of Star Wars era? Twin Peaks, even though I'm I, 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 not deeply familiar with it like you are, uh, I grew up in that era where everyone had that question of who shot Laura Palmer. I didn't even know who Laura Palmer was, but I knew she was dead. Yeah. Um, but you're so right the, the way to look at it uh, about what that could lead. But I also want to defend you. Defend yourself. When Stephen Schiff was more in control of Andor, the idea of it being an SBI show mm. was yeah. was probably a fair bet. <laughs> probably, yeah, pro a fair probably a fair bet. <laughs> yeah. And you, you, can, can I have to point out that you conflated the the two great murder mystery slogans of the 80s uh, and 90s for Twin Peaks. But oh, who shot J.R.R.? Yeah. Uh, oh, know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, nobody she, shot Laura Palmer, thank you. Okay. She just, she and, just no, but anyway. And Mr. Burns. Just yes, throwing who Mr. shot? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I I remember going to the grocery store and you know Twin Peaks and Simpsons were taken off at the same time, and somebody yep. was just wearing this homemade T-shirt that said Bart Simpson killed Laura Palmer. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, Jennifer, what are your thoughts about this mystery label and the way uh, Leslie Headland is describing the nature of the mystery? I don't. I okay. I really loved Russian Doll, which was done by Leslie Headland. And I think that if you look at that show, that's how I'm going to approach this show. I would not really classify it as a mystery. I would say that it, there's a lot of psychological things that throughout the, each episode that make you guess. You're kind of disoriented. You're not sure. You're trying to figure out what is happening. And then at the end of the episode, she would always leave it with like a great cliffhanger that would make me go, oh my gosh, we got to watch the next episode. Mm. So I kind of see it like that. But I think that the reason why she's having to say this mystery thing is to let Star Wars fans know, you guys, we're not going to tie this up in a neat bow every episode. I know you guys like to know everything that's happening, but that's <laughs> not going to happen. Let mm. it play out. And we're mm. probably not going to know until towards the end of the season. Um, and I'm saying that for myself. <laughs> Who wants to know if it's tech 2.0? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it, that's that's the fun of a uh, 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 mysterious show, even if it's not like a literal mm -hmm. mystery of uh, a simple mm -hmm. answer. Like, yeah, Russian Doll is like a weird thing is happening. How is it happening? How how can we fix it? Like, and that's that's a little bit more amorphous than Who Done It. And yeah, think, right. Like yeah. It's a murder mystery type of thing. Yeah, you, you said something great there, Jed, of, of what is happening. And you have this thought of 50 years before the Phantom Menace and we got the, the Sith merger. We're going to talk more of those details. But just like that's kind of a, almost a good title, uh, a thesis statement for the show. Like what the hell is happening? There's a lot of things going on. It's not normal. Yeah. We got to figure this out. Versus, you know, if, if if every episode ended with the Peter Falk like character turning to the camera and going, ah, one more thing. <laughs> like, that'd be cool, but not, not expecting that. But oh, yeah, I love that. God. I love that phrase you used, Jed. Yeah, mm. yeah. I'm looking forward to the mystery. Um, moving on to a little bit more uh, character discussion. 
Uh, the uh, article said Master Souls Padawan is Jackie Lon, played by Daphne Keene, who describes her as Jedi David Bowie. Uh, Jackie Jackie yeah. is apparently much uh, right. Right. I'm like I'm all in. I don't care about anything else. Uh, Jedi David Bowie. I'm in. Come on, yeah. let's go. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackie is apparently much more competent than Jedi Knight Yord Fandar, played by Charlie Barnett. Uh, the two are seen in a header image in a snowy environment, seemingly investigating something, Daphne Keene added. But uh, he, Yord, is a, he's a knight. Uh, he's older. So there's this really interesting dynamic of him being a little bit useless and her being like, you need to step your game up, which was really fun to play. Uh, a lot of discussion also of Yord <laughs> being a very a rule follower, yeah. kind of stuck in the mud, sure of himself, Jedi Knight, who's a bit useless. Now, Ken, you're cracking up. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, because Yord's the guy I already picked to be my guy. And she's oh, like, no. yeah, I'm stuck with this dummy. Oh, no. That was one of my oh, main no. thoughts of, if you're going to have an uptight, overconfident guide, Yord is such a great name. <laughs> like Everybody going back to the Jedi Temple and going, oh, bleeping Yord. You hear yeah. what Yord did? Oh, oh, Yord. Come Damn on, Mark. Yord. Um, so these kind of great, mm. to me, Detailed interpersonal Jedi dynamics are a big mm. part of what I had hoped for when the High Republic was announced and what High Republic has really delivered. It, it's not a bunch of Jedi. It's a bunch of unique individuals who are also Jedi navigating this incredible responsibility and challenge of being a Jedi. Uh, Jennifer, for you, what what's the excitement or the power of, of seeing those kind of detailed interpersonal interactions between Jedi in live action. It paints a more com complex picture of the Jedi uh, leading up to our, our next talking point. Um, I think it's, I can't think of any time that we've seen that with the Jedi in live action. I mean, we joke about it with the Jedi Council, right? Of these kind of useless, <laughs> useless Jedi uh, members, but actually making that the focal point of the story and the focal point of this relationship, I think is going to provide some, maybe some comedy. Whether <laughs> I know that Leslie did such a great job with Russian doll bringing in com comedic mm -hmm. elements. So that could be actually very funny. I'm looking forward to it. It's an interesting take. Yeah. Yeah, how do you feel about Jedi David Bowie? I don't, I'm not a David Bowie fan. I know people okay. are very passionate about David Bowie. To I'm me, out. I think of just like Ziggy Stardust. I just think I'm of like, out. the. the I know, I'm sorry. We've had this discussion before. <laughs> he just doesn't move me. I'm sorry. Uh, like, But like the visual, like, I mean, he's mm -hmm. obviously like an androgynous. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I can't think of like, what does that mean? I can't grasp onto anything. So Ken, <laughs> explain to me, what does that mean? Uh, but, well, quite frankly, it, it's like, what era? What version? You right. Know, mm -hmm. An artist, right. soul. I, yeah. Looking at Jekyll Lon's uh, appearance, mm -hmm. I wonder if it is a little bit more space age, moon age, yeah. daydream, Bowie of this sort of uh, just, uh, this just utter confidence in being different and, mm. and being um yeah maybe androgynous but not even it's not even as specific as just that it's that sort of like um i am ethereal i am otherworldly i am different and it's great it just is deal with it um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of that sort like of spock. early <laughs> like <laughs> like uh like uh like spock who bleeps uh, okay i mean i think okay. <laughs> to be perfectly honest yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. okay yeah. i like yeah. that that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> ashes to ashes, fun to funky. You know, yeah. Jackie Lawn is a Jedi. I think that's yeah. that's what it's going to be. Just Jedi. <laughs> David Bowie quotes translated. Okay, I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. I'm I'm very excited. I'm very excited. Uh, <laughs> maybe her lightsaber turns into a guitar. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like it's just based off David Bowie in that 1999 clip explaining the internet when no one understood what it was going to be it's yeah. just that that bowie yeah um yeah can't wait to see can't wait to find out yeah. uh ken uh, you know you and i have fallen behind where we want to be on keeping up mm -hmm. with uh the high republic but but this feels very much like that um and I, I don't mean to um bash the prequels or the clone wars and we do get deep interpersonal dynamics from our main characters of obi-wan and anakin and and Ahsoka and Mace is a clearly drawn character and Yoda is a clearly drawn character. But I think a lot of the storytelling in that era is that they have fallen into the lockstep. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, we get Qui-Gon, we get Ahsoka who challenges, but a lot of the other, like, Plo Koon is awesome, Kiadi Mundi is awesome, but they're in lockstep, they're in agreement, mm -hmm. they're not questioning things, there's not as much diversity of thought, mm -hmm. and I think that's the power of High Republican of this, how are you feeling about getting to see that on screen? I, I think I'm at a point where I, I could appreciate it more than any other uh, time in my Star Wars fandom. Uh, you, you're right. I mean, they're, they're, you, you've spoken often too of one of the great joys of of, of the going into the prequels was, oh my God, it's not just Luke and the ghost of Obi Wan and Yoda. It, it, we're going to get a bunch of Jedi, and it's going to mm -hmm. be an action. And I think th th you're right. There's a lot of it, interpersonal dyna dynamics on display, Clone Wars stuff too. But there's just something a little more unique about what we might be getting here, what we have gotten High Republic, and not not spoiling anything. Again, I'm only sixty pages in it, but that Living Force book, there's some great like m micro dynamics at play where like literally there's like an eye roll of uh, we all know Qui-Gon like there's just like <laughs> this wonderful uh of working relationship I'm not trying to turn this into an office place comedy or something like that but even what she's describing is I I, I love this idea of, of 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 seeing the Jedi's as as living beings right who make mistakes who, who will be open to slipping and sliding down the uh the moral uh slide like my pen mm -hmm. that just dropped there uh all that stuff um so yeah I, I'm excited for that and and I think in the past it would have been just more like, nah, nah, them on one team fighting. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is interesting to me. I think it speaks to just like the Jedi of the, the you know, fall of the Jedi era of the prequels and the Clone Wars. It's just like a lot of them are, I think, really follow the doctrine mm -hmm. of have your emotions on lockdown and that that's the best yes. way to be a Jedi. And so they are very withheld. Um, and I, I love stories where we get to see that the Jedi are people too mm -hmm. and see that some of what makes them different might give them more power, might give them strength to lean into. This is how I'm different from this other Jedi. And I'm, I have, I'm good at this ability and I'm going to lean into that. And I'm not going to be afraid to be different. And, uh, yep. My dark emotions are a problem. They're there. I have imperfections. I have to wrestle with them. Uh, this other Jedi is a great Jedi, but God, they get on my nerves. <laughs> that all that stuff that makes Jedi people too, to me, makes it more admirable. This struggle to, to, walk this difficult path of being a Jedi to acknowledge like it's really not easy. Um, but, uh, but that makes my commitment to walking this difficult path even more powerful and, and impressive. Hmm. You're basically pitching a stand up green room show of oh, God damn it, they're here. They're funny. Their last special was great, but they're God, they're new. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, that's what it is. <sighs> yeah, Yord, that, that bit lands every time, but it's so hack. God, hack. Yord, what a hack. Your Go do more hat. crowd work, Yord. <laughs> anyway, on that note, and now that Ken has retrieved his pen, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be back to discuss more of these great insights from Empire Magazine's coverage of the Acolyte back in a moment. And we are back, pens and David Bowie thoughts at the ready to continue to discuss the Acolyte. Uh, Leslie Headland also uh, talked a, a bit about some of the uh, individual characters. We got some quotes from some of the actors. Uh, Leslie Headland says, Carrie Ann Moss's character is inspired by Trinity. So if you want to refer to her as Trinity with a lightsaber, <laughs> Leslie Headland seemed like, go for it. Uh, Carrie Ann Moss herself is quoted as being very impressed with Leslie Headland and said, I felt that a few times in my career with some of the big things I've done, Memento, The Matrix, where you're talking to the filmmaker and you just go, oh, they totally get it. They know it so well that I trust them. Uh, the article also discusses influences for uh, Mandela Stenberg's uh, character, May, uh, saying, uh, I believe this is Leslie Headland's quote, talking about May. One of my references was Gogo from Kill Bill. I've always loved that character. We also thought about Joan of Arc, Ethiopian tribes, Renaissance garb. There was something very tough and very feminine about it at the same time. We wanted this character to feel both disciplined and have a sense of freedom and an expressiveness to her. So uh, kind of combined a couple different sort of thoughts about uh, inspirations for characters and kind of peaks inside the creative process between creator and actor. Jennifer, what are your thoughts on these quotes? I want to see this in a behind the scenes featurette. <laughs> I need to see the costume design process, the concept art. I need to see the, the references, the hair and makeup, because from what I've seen from the trailer and these stills, Oh my God. It's so rich. It's there. Oh, I can, I can see these references and I want to, I want to see mood boards. Um, and I, I just, I love it. I love that so much detail was put into each character as of course we would expect. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, it, yeah, it's very evocative. Uh, very mm -hmm. evocative, I think. Uh, Ken, what are your thoughts on some of these character inspirations and details? I haven't thought of Gogo -Go Yubari in a long time, and I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the uh, Kill Bill series. Mm -hmm. um, give or take Tarantino overall sometimes, but uh, uh, that's an interesting take. But I, I wanted to jump to the Carrie M. Awesome of it all. Like, I, I love that. Oh, by the way, it's like, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I thought of Trinity. So we went out and got Trinity. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we can, and we yeah. did. And that's awesome. Yeah. And and I love that. Uh, I really love what Carrie Ann Moss is saying here about uh, they know it so well that I trust them. They totally get it. All those words mean a lot to me as a Star Wars fan. I don't need every creator in Star Wars to be a Star Wars fan. In fact, sometimes it might, it might even be better. Who knows? Look at Andor. But I, I just – every time – we've said this here before, but any time Leslie Headland has, has spoken about Star Wars, I just think she understands what it can be. Uh, not, not what it should be, but what it can be, the potential of Star Wars as uh, its own kind of genre, its own kind mm -hmm. of storytelling. I don't love all the EU stuff. She was an EU kid. doesn't matter. She's going to pull not just the names and the places, but she's going to pull what matters from those stories. And every time she's spoken or given an interview, I've, I've, I've seen so many now over the years, I just do this. Yeah, I nod, I nod. And so to have mm -hmm. a veteran like Carrie Moss, and this is not in terms of just Star Wars, but just in terms of the project and the creativity of it all. Um, of her just going, oh, yeah, 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 this is working. Like, this is working. It feels good. It feels good as a fan to hear that. Yeah, no, I really, really, really agree, I think, um, to hear from Carrie Ann Moss that, like, yeah, everything that's coming across of Leslie Headland in these interviews that she's the kind of creator who isn't, like, I don't know, I'm kind of figuring out as I go because they're different kind of creators, and, and I think that's a valid approach to it. Be like, I know the big picture, but I'm kind of fishing around for her to go, like, mm -hmm. oh, no, she's a person who knows, like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're not going to stump this this director about the themes about what the characters believe and why and how and mm. how how to best express that character and where the idea of the character came from there are different kinds of creators but but i think this is the kind of creator that i try to be like of like mm. if an actor comes to me and goes what's going on that i can tell them entirely mm. beginning middle and end and then open it up for the create the actor to to be a part of that process as well but to give the actor the confidence that like it i didn't just kind of like i don't know I thought I thought this character looked cool, so we threw him in the corner. But like, no, here's exactly why they're there. You know, is is powerful. Uh, it's also fun for me to see um, uh, to see creators in the uh, 2020s be inspired by the genre storytelling of the 90s and early 2000s. Like George was inspired in the 70s and 80s, making the original trilogy by yeah. the genre storytelling of the 40s and 50s. It's it, Star Wars is very much its own genre. But yeah. then going through and going like, well, what is what what caused passion in me as a kid or a young adult or a teen? And how can I infuse the story I'm, I'm telling with the things that that excited me? And so for her mm -hmm. to be pulling these very specific late 90s, early 2000s references of of Trinity and Gogo -Go from Kill Bill. That's really interesting to me that's because so it's fun. it's a story yeah. of, you know, I, I, I never remember Leslie Helen's exact age. So I don't know what age she was when she saw Trinity and Kill Bill. Um but Trinity and Kill Bill are both like powerful cinematic iconic visions of uh, a physical uh, uh, prowess mm -hmm. of fighters. In mm -hmm. Trinity, we get to dig a little bit deeper and get to know her. But but Gogo Go is just this sort of like fascinating, like a 17 year old girl who is the bodyguard to one of mm -hmm. the best killers in the world. So what does it take mm -hmm. to be a 17 year old girl and be the bodyguard to one of the best assassins in the world to me it's just all sort of working through images and ideas of what does power mean on a physical level what does it mean on an emotional level what does it mean with what you choose to do with it uh, th those aren't random references to me they're they're meaty icons of cinema for a reason because they're all tied up in these ideas that i think acolyte is going to play with you were also unintentionally doing that game we see on the internet all the time of, of like Kill Bill, The Matrix, and prequels are to us now as like something from the fifties was to us in the eighties. You know, where like stuff that blows your mind, you're like, that's impossible. Um, and and yeah. I and I I think that's um I think that's important because yeah that that era is 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 highly influential. It was a, it was a very interesting, intriguing, compelling era of film. Uh, that was the era that I watched every Oscars and had my cheat sheet and watched every movie in the theater. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the Ken of then. 
compared to the Ken now <laughs> house for movies. So it's uh, highly uh, influ- influential and, and to see it on display here is going to be interesting. Yeah. She yeah. also did an interview with a Hollywood reporter in March of this year. And she is absolutely a film nerd. Cause she referenced totally. uh, two other, I think it was like a samurai film from the 1950s and some, some other film from like the forties or fifties. I was like, Oh wow. Like I had to look it up. Cause I did <laughs> not know. I know mm-hmm. these characters, but I was like, what? Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's also going to be an influence. So that was, I thought really impressive that she's blending this classic with also the new, I don't want to say the new, but the fresher, the new fresher, one. Yeah. But like classic too, but, but old enough now to be classic. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And I think for, for those of who are older, like all these new references, like Trinity from 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Like, yo, kill bill, you know, from 20 <laughs> years ago, this, mm-hmm. you know, like it's not new. It's, it's people saw it at an age where it was foundational for them the way mm-hmm. the OG trilogy was to, to people our, our age. Uh, that's great. Yeah, she's talked about the Shaw Brothers a lot, so I'm going to make a point of watching some Shaw Brothers films. So yeah, great point, Jennifer. That it is. It's not like she's just like I'm remixing the hits of my ch- childhood and teens. It's right, right throughout the spectrum of of genre history. It's a really great point. Yeah. Um, moving on here, Le- uh, Leslie Hedden also sort of reaffirmed what she said before about the villain perspective and even Sith perspective of the show. She says. I was driven to write a story that essentially was from the perspective of the bad guys. I write that way with my other work. I am always attracted to amoral or immoral characters and finding the humanity within the villains. Uh, Ken, we talk a lot about, um, about, you know, Star Wars having a lot to say uh, about the villains, having empathy for them, but also kind of having this sort of moral guardrails of at, at the end of the day, Star Wars is, is uh, you can play with all the cool toys of Vader, Kylo Ren, Darth Maul, um, but at the end of the day, it wants you to root for the heroes. So where do you go with uh, with this reaffirmation that this is is a bad guy show? I, I really do like that. I'm going to put aside any trepidation I have on what the discourse will be. And yeah, see, told you the Jedi were horrible, and they're hor- you know that that can that can burn me a little bit. I get a little grumpy at that, but I don't think it's going to be present in this show or in the. And the themes and what they're doing here, and 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 there wasn't there. I I didn't remember the interview. There was something else where she's kind of basically like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a Sith involved, right? Yeah, we we've been playing this game of yeah, red blade doesn't mean Sith and all this stuff. And who knows? I don't even think that's the mm-hmm. Sith. But the idea of the you know, there's a, a master, an apprentice, but also an acolyte. And and we've seen that's EU stuff. We've also kind of seen it with the Asajj Ventress. But all that to say, I I, I do uh, number one clearly. I trust what she's going to do. And two, yeah, I think this is valuable. Uh, if you're going to analyze the fall of the Jedi or the beginning of of the cracks in that foundation, why not look at as someone who's pointing out some truths? We love that Barris Afi, Count Dooku are examples of that. I, I'd say Ventress at times, uh, not a, not a villain, but a Sokotano's view of of what they did to her at that point in the order. Like it's all valuable mm-hmm. and all going to be uh, really interesting. I, I think too, this is going to be one of those um, series as somewhat intended where you're going to watch this series, at least season one, and you're going to put on Phantom Menace and have a different view of it, right? Mm-hmm. Of, 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 oh, that's, I see that more, or, you know, you're fun exploring some of the, the, the conversations Phantom Menace, Attack the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith might mean more now, uh, not by canon connection, but by that emotional canon we love celebrating here. Um, I, I'm excited to see her take on that, even if I have some fears of what some of the discourse will be. Mm-hmm. And that's just being honest. Jennifer, how are you feeling about the the confirmation of a, a of a, a story told from the bad guys' perspective? Still calling them bad guys. It isn't a right, <laughs> justice right. for the bad guys. They're right. It's just saying it's from their perspective. Right, right. And she said that uh, Leslie has said that the show will explore a different perspective on the same events. So I think mm. that that's interesting. It's going to provide yeah. both takes, right, from a different point of from from a certain point mm. of view, as, as we would say. Um, and I just want to say that Amanda Amanda Stenberg goes by uh, both she, her, and they, them pronouns. Because um, mm. I want to mention that Leslie Headland has said that she pitched the show as Frozen meets Kill Bill. So that makes me think <laughs> that Amanda's character is like Elsa from Frozen in that maybe Amanda's character has this incredible power and everyone around her is like, no, you can't use your power to your full potential. You have to tamper it down, right? You have to like suppress it. Mm. And she really starts to have a lot of anger and resentment. Um, and then she mm. goes and kills everyone. Uh, that's not part of Frozen, but, <laughs> but wow. I think that, that could be a scene. What's happening over there in Disney? <laughs> 
It's the, yeah. the third one. Um, let yeah, it go, but I, let it go, let the heads roll. I think that's how the famous song goes. Yeah. Right. But I thought that that was a really interesting Frozen meets Kill Bill. What? Um, I just love wow. it. I love Leslie Headland's take on this. And I'm excited because yeah. I think that there is going to be a lot of empathy for these quote unquote villains. Yeah, no, I, I love the. I forgot about that one. The, the art of uh, the Acolyte book is going to be a thick book with all of the great quotes from Leslie Adlin as uh, she's described the process of, of this film. Yeah, um, yeah. I, to me, it is just it's all about that idea of empathy. I think Star Wars always does a great job of uh, not treating most villains. Sometimes we don't have the time to get into it, uh, but not treating people as just like, ah, that, that kid ain't right. And so they do bad things mm -hmm. of like, People mm -hmm. have hard things happen to them. They have things that are deeply, deeply unfair happen to them. And then there's a choice to double down on that anger and, and you know, repeat the process, the cycle. And um, mm -hmm. and so playing with that that line of I have great empathy for what happened to you, but I can't go along with you on the, the actions of violence you chose to take in response to it. To me, that's kind of classic Star Wars. And if that's what this is, I'm thrilled. Uh, and... I think uh, there's also this great uh, uh, potential for story uh, of of the Jedi. If it's a lot of perspectives on the Jedi, the choices the Jedi are making as well is that there's to me, there's room and I hope for that. There are Jedi who are sort of advocating doing not great things, locking, mm. locking down the force and being they're the ones who control it. They're the ones who decide who's in the order. If other force users are getting out of line, they're the one who's like, mm, don't use the dark side that way. Um, that we could still have room for Jedi who are like, no, we need to be open. And they lose the argument, mm -hmm. which leads us towards the rigidity of the prequel era. But that to me also just gives me hope that there could be Jedi that were sort of like, we're on their side. They're trying to make the right choice. And, and they lose the philosophical battle within the Jedi order. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to be able to see, I'm hoping for some of that perspective too. So it isn't just the Jedi are jerks. I don't think it's going to be that simple. It just doesn't seem like she's right, right that simple. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, it, and uh, Jennifer, your your great frozen reminder. Um, I, I'm really curious of, to see if that's where we're headed, uh, not just with May, but also with with that new coven. Uh, of yeah. Oh, the, uh, the Mother Anna Sia, I believe um, that there's a huge difference between the Sith who want to use the dark side to take over everything. And maybe a coven of witches on on one planet who want to use the dark side. The way they use it they're not particularly bothering anybody. And if the Jedi start to come in and go, mm, no, you, you can't touch the dark right. side at all. Is that, that's a really interesting frozen. Like mm. we, we decide who uses their power when. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just any other. Candle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no right. spell candles. That's yeah. I can't wait for that episode. Um, uh, all right. We're going to move on from the dark side to Wookiees. Uh, there's uh, some great Wookiee discussion here. Uh, actor Charlie Barnett, who plays Yord, uh, oh, also boy. teased to Empire a trip to Wookiee planet, though interestingly, it will not be Kashyyyk. Uh, so there's that. Then a lot of uh, quotes from uh, Jonas Swadamo, who uh, played Chewbacca in several of the recent Star Wars films. Uh, he had this quote about being a Jedi Wookiee. Uh, he said, Kalnaka, being a Jedi, that sets certain expectations to how you carry yourself in the line of duty. There are certain assumptions that can be made as to whether he lets his emotions take control of him to the extent that Chewbacca would, for example. It was very interesting to bake that into the character and try to personify that on screen. He also shared some uh, a great uh, a bit of advice that Peter Mayhew gave him about uh, Chewbacca being a mime. <laughs> mm. Saying the audience doesn't understand what he, Chewbacca, is saying exactly. But they interpret his mannerisms and every little twitch and every little movement in roar. Uh, finally, uh, he talked about the differences between Kalnaka and Buryaga, the Jedi Wookiee who is featured in the High Republic uh, publishing line. And he says, I was aware of the character and I talked to the High Republic writers at a convention. <laughs> I also wanted to differentiate Kalnaka from Buryaga and not copy too much from those stories. So that was just a, a big Wookiee collection. So Jen... You're a Wookiee fan. What's exciting here? A, a new Wookiee planet? Wookiees as mimes? A depressed Jedi Wookiee? What gets you excited? 
seeing one Wookiee gets me very excited. <laughs> seeing many Wookiees gets me a little worried, especially if it's if it's a community that we're going to be stumbling upon. Uh, I know that they did not use the volume for uh, this series, so then it's going to be up to the CGI AI, um, which makes me think, please, please don't make this look like oh my gosh i want to have a lot of wookie extras is what i'm saying mm. i need there to be yeah. physic physical wookies there <laughs> and i need to have some practical set elements to it and then they can fill it in with their with their ilm magic right but i i don't I, no offense but i don't want it to be a prequel scenario where mm. you know what i mean it just mm -hmm. it just does it needs to feel more real more tangible for me mm. and then i'll get excited yeah how do you feel? That makes perfect sense. I, and I totally understand the concern that, that the Wookiees could look a little cut and paste kind of thing. Um, and you want them to be living, breathing, swinging on vines. Um, how do you feel about the idea of another uh, uh, Wookiee community that is not on Kashyyyk? It makes sense, right? Why not? Of yeah. course. Uh, why not set up camp? somewhere else i'm just excited and i hope that well i don't know we'll see i'm not going to get ahead of myself <laughs> Would, uh, Ch children wookies oh yeah <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> um so if we if, if this is all correct and, and uh we're, we're going to a different wookie location would you like to see them in in different kinds of trees like i think they're always going to be tree friendly but like what if they're on like a planet like scarif <laughs> and they live in the palm trees <laughs> I just think of that matte that. painting from the from the Star Wars Holiday uh, special, you know, of of the treehouse. Um, mm -hmm. I'd rather have that. Like, uh, okay. <laughs> give me the matte painting. I don't know. I, I get scared. I get scared. <laughs> I understand. Uh, Wookie tensions run high. Yeah. Uh, Ken, where do your various Wookie thoughts go? Uh, I don't. You know, it's, I don't live. A, I was thinking about. It, I don't live a life where I have a lot of Wookie thoughts all the time. So I love yours, Jen. Uh, but um, um, <laughs> and I know you, there's the revenge of the Sith of it all. I, I, you know, the, we were finally going to Kashyyyk, and I was really excited about that. And, and we spent some good seconds on there, you know. And it's important for Yoda and all that stuff. But I know what you mean. Uh, it was a CGI, uh, you know, achievement getting all those Wookiees there. But I, I'd like yeah. to spend some time there. As far as being another planet, though, that is kind of exciting. We we live in a, a Star Wars era where we have off-world Jawas. There's no rules anymore. We can we yeah. can get uh, there can be an entire another Ewok planet. Let's do it. Let's do it. So uh, uh, I'm intrigued to explore that. I do I, I do like just uh, Yoda Swatomo being in Star Wars. Uh, 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 some more is a good thing. Um, just seems like one of the best of the best out there and, and uh, was excited to see um, and hear and learn that he was coming back. So I'm excited for this character uh, just because uh, I love Brian Ward's photo of uh, Kalnaka and Jeremiah Johnson being the, the same, uh, <laughs> which kids was a Robert Redford movie that turned into a meme that no one knows the original movie from. Uh, I just I, I, I'm excited about this. Um, uh, when I say I have no Wookiee thoughts, I just know there's a lot of folks super excited about Buryaga and, and Wookiees. I, I just grew up with Chewie. Chewie was my Wookiee, and I didn't think much about other Wookiees. That's where I come mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really excited for this character, and I know you are excited for the character of Kelnaka as well, Ken. I think, you know, the idea of a, a, a Wookiee, a Jedi, and a depressed guy walk into a bar, and the twist is, it's all the same guy. It's a depressed <laughs> Jedi Wookiee. Is just like, oh. I mean, we're, we're kind of inferring the depressed. We've heard in the interviews that he <laughs> yeah, wants yeah, to be yeah. alone and his head is always yeah. hung and just like, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, they, uh, I hope Kelnock is struggling because I love that. I just, I love that this growth of Star Wars that, you know, mm. Wookiee isn't a character. It, you know, yeah. Wookiee is yeah. a, a whole collection of different beings. Um, mm. And to hear all these thoughts about how to make him unique, to he hear about like, well, what is powerful about Chewbacca and the way the audience relates to him is, yeah, Chewbacca's vocal. Like, it's one of my favorite things. And in, in, you watch A New Hope on uh, Disney Plus mm -hmm. and you look at all of Chewie's captions. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. He's talking during, he's got opinions during the medal ceremony. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, just don't like so to lose. Yeah. What is a reserved Jedi? Wookiee look like you know mm -hmm. how is it not just Briaga? I, I think making it a unique character is so so powerful to me and uh, yeah. and Briaga is younger right mm -hmm. if I remember yeah it's been a bit for High Republic of me but yeah yeah, yeah so and, I like Kanak has been around a bit you know yeah mm -hmm. and at least mm -hmm. Briaga as we knew him is like very caring very passionate and if Kanak mm -hmm. has been like I, I'm I'm 300 years old I've been around the block and I'm having doubts you know yeah. 
that's very different than yeah. <laughs> Briaga. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm very excited mm -hmm. to see the expansion of another Wookiee planet. I hope they have houses and palm trees. Uh, give them a little something different to swing around on. Uh, all right, finally, uh, we've got some reveals about the uh, character from the High Republic Publishing Initiative, uh, Vernestra Rowe, uh, the acolyte showrunner Leslie Headlin confirmed last month that only one character from the High Republic novels will be making the force jump into the live action series, and it is indeed Vernestra Rowe. Uh, the Padawan whom readers of the book have grown to love is now 116 years old and a much more tempered and respected Jedi Master. She's also played by Headland's wife, Rebecca Henderson. Uh, discussing her age, uh, Leslie Headland said, you know, her being 116, that has resulted in, in Vernestra going from this fun-seeking adventurer character to a little bit closer to the kind of Jedi that we see in The Phantom Menace. Because she has been around for so long, she has basically met everyone that has come to the temple and seen them all die their natural deaths if they're living a natural human life. She's known uh, Jedi Master Soul since he was a tiny child. Uh, she also said on the future, uh, on being asked about the future of other High Republic characters from the publishing initiative making a live uh, action appearance and said, I've already talked to Pablo Hidalgo about it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Ken, two, two questions here, just kind of thoughts on adapting Vernestra at a different age uh, to appear in this show. And also that last quote, does it suggest more on screen storytelling in the general High Republic era? Well, there's other High Republic uh, characters we need on screen, like Yoda, Opo and Sissus. You know, hopefully those High Republic uh, characters will make the <laughs> jump to live action here. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, you know, i uh, love to uh, uh, see any of those characters. Again, I'm so behind on, on High Republic now, and I say that with regret. Like, I really love Phase 1, Light of the Jedi. I still want to – it may still be my favorite Star Wars book in the modern era. Like, I really, really enjoyed that. So I love that. But just to take well, – this is about a 100-year leap with the, uh, Vernestra, right? Mm -hmm. She's about 13, 16. She's a, she's a wonder kid. Yeah, yeah, 16, right? So, uh, wow, a century leap forward. Yeah, that's going to change you. That's going to – that's going to, you know, uh, I, I don't even, I'm not even assuming this is a cynical uh, 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 downbeat look at it all, but mm -hmm. it's a realistic look at it. And and there's a little bit of that, like, uh, yeah, yeah, we've been through this before. <laughs> like a little bit of that, like, don't worry, don't worry. But also maybe we should worry. But the fact that it, it, it sees her sliding into the, quote, type of Jedi that we see in The Phantom Menace, um, I don't even quite know what to make of it. And I like that. Um, uh, I like uh, to explore that. In a, in, a, in a Jedi character that that started, you know, she's a rookie prospect. She's a, she's called up to the bigs early and we're excited for mm -hmm. her. see here at this point. I love it. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I love uh, part of her story in in the in phase one. And I am also not caught up. But it's like, yeah, she's been promoted to Jedi Knight past the trials at 16. And there's a great passage in one of the books where she sort of reflects on she had a uh, some an easier path because she came from a community that celebrated when mm -hmm. a, a young child displayed force abilities and were like ready for the party when the Jedi came in that mm -hmm. other communities were like, we'll let this happen, but we're kind of bummed out about it. Or other communities didn't really have a relationship, but, it, but she had just like this endless support is like glowing go. And, and so to have a, mm -hmm. a life that sort of, in a way, I feel like she's kind of this great star Wars storytelling uh, of like, a gifted kid who's naturally really talented and has just oodles of support from everyone around you. Yeah, and yeah. then when life hits, it's almost even harder because everything's gone perfectly for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, if we met her when everything was going great and then, you know, in the book, she starts to have doubts and fears and all, and you know, yeah. losses and all that. Um, but to me, that's really exciting to take a, a, a character that we met is the gifted kid <laughs> where everything yeah. was coming pretty easy. And now, a mm -hmm. hundred years later, that great Star Wars storytelling of get, you, getting old is your, your risk at becoming too wounded, too rigid, shutting off your emotions. And to see the character struggle with that is, is always really interesting. Uh, Jen, I know you haven't. Uh, have you read any of the High Republic stuff? Not one page. Okay. Not yes. one page. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what relationship do you have with this? For you, is this, uh, how do you feel about it? I think it's great that it's gonna uh, it's gonna tap into the High Republic fans, fans who are familiar with this character. Yes, yes, yes. But Leslie Headland has said it is going to be a cameo, which means mm. to me like probably one scene, and it will be short. 
Uh, if you don't know it, like me, it's not going to take away from the storyline. I think that that's smart. It's just a little bit of like, hey, High Republic fans, here's this character that you know. Um, I, I think that th it's wise to tap into that fan base, uh, but it's okay if we don't if we don't know who this character is, <laughs> like me. Yeah, yeah, no, I I don't think it's going to be any like wink, wink, nod, nod. You know, yeah. my light whip um, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, how do you feel about, uh, you know, Acolyte's done. She's not going to just real quick shove in another <laughs> uh, High Republic publishing character on the side. Uh, when she says she's talking to Pablo Hidalgo about it, does it does it uh, get you excited that she's perhaps continuing to work on Star Wars or work in this general era? It does make me wonder what that means. Is there a season two for Acolyte where she would bring in somehow more High Republic characters? Is this a whole other High Republic show? movie i just think that the high republic is so has a fervent fan base it would be foolish not to capitalize on it mm -hmm. but then that means that people if you're a fan like me who has not read it we're gonna have to start reading these books and there's a lot so <laughs> buckle up because i think it's coming <laughs> whether it's a tv show or movie yeah i mean i've really loved high republic uh, you know i i it, but it's a lot it's hard it's to keep hot. up with and there's a part of me that would be like i would love high republic even more if they pumped the brakes a little bit on the release uh schedule uh but uh maybe nubs will wander through because you have seen some high republic because that is you know oh yeah, yeah. maybe nubs will maybe in the darkest okay. most upsetting scene nubs will just <laughs> <laughs> walk through yes <laughs> Uh, Ken, do you have any uh, thoughts on uh, the possibility of more High Republic era live action storytelling, more Leslie Headland storytelling? I, I, I yeah, yeah, I, I hadn't really thought of whether this was a series or a season, right? Like, uh, I, I can't remember the announcements, and it's been so long at this point. Uh, I, I totally would be excited, having not seen the show yet. So uh, I'm going to assume I'm going to like it, but we'll see. We'll see how it's executed. Uh, and put up on screen, but yeah, uh, more or her exploring other eras or going back uh, deeper, maybe going closer to Phantom Menace, maybe exploring the 10 years between Phantom Menace and Acolyte. It seems this is definitely mm -hmm. an era important to Leslie Headland. And, uh, uh, you know, having grown up, uh, uh, as she says, a kind of a prequel quid kid, uh, more of a, a teenager during that time, if I believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as for other High Republic stuff, yeah, this just seems natural. I think they tried. They did such a good college try of this is a publishing initiative. Mm -hmm. Don't you worry. Um, I, then I remember reading Light of the Jedi and thinking they've made a mistake. This is a movie. Like, mm. why not do this now? But I totally get what they've done, and it's been successful for those that love it. It's, it's such a passionate fan base. And I say for those that love it, meaning it, it's still, Jen, you're an example. If you don't have time to read them all, the comics I've run out. My comic shop actually just closed. I, 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 I was... It, the decision to stop reading Star Wars comics easily has been made for me. My shop just it, it was because you didn't pick up those High Republic comics. Yeah. They went under. <laughs> no. That was an email they sent out. If Knapsack <laughs> had picked up the High Republic comics, all 92 of them. Um, but I, I, We're so just I, I, this many dollars short. It's exactly yeah. the same amount as Ken's exactly. comics. Our rent was this. I'm, all that to say, like, I don't think, I do not believe that High Republic was just a laboratory to see if this could translate to to, to mm -hmm. screen i really don't right. think so i really do believe james wall and uh, sigling and all those people sat down to build this out as, as a published initiative and i think that was the right decision in the end but there's so many characters there's so many things to explore and this excites me to explore it in a, in a way that uh, will take less time than reading books for me <laughs> yeah honest. that's right i hate to sound um, like yord yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm so excited for the Acolyte. I love the trailer. I've loved everything mm -hmm. that Leslie Helen has been talking about. I think exploring this era, seeing Jedi with lots of different perspectives, seeing Force users with lots of different perspectives is, is something I've been craving. High Republic Publishing delivered that. I'm excited to see it delivered in live action. Uh, with the Acolyte. So I really hope that there's more Star Wars storytelling. And, and I think it, in this era, in the general high public mm -hmm. era, be it in the general time of the publishing initiative or, you know, going all the way up to Phantom Menace, I, I hope that that continues. Or Ken, like you're saying, if, yeah, if there was a show set between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, uh, high Republic era characters could, could live that long. I think I'm also just really aware of the nuts and bolts reality of you know, as fans, we get excited about what story should be told, what era, what character. But I think a lot of what behind the scenes makes it possible is having a, a really solid creative lead who 
kind of has, I'm the mastermind of this era and, mm -hmm. and Favreau and now even more so Filoni are, th they've got the reins of the new Republic era. So lots of storytelling can happen in that era because they're really mm -hmm. on it. So mm -hmm. if Leslie Headland became like the, I am the mastermind of, of this era of Star Wars storytelling and maybe there mm -hmm. are other creators, but she's kind of holding it all together. I think mm -hmm. that makes it more possible because they need, as Kathleen Kennedy said in, in uh, interviews, it's really hard to just kind of have everything be a one-off relationship with a creator. We need strong right. relationships with creators who can shepherd right. things for, for a while. So that's, that's the excitement for me if, if she could become that for this other era. Mm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Love that. All right. Uh, that's, there's lots more to pull, but that's, uh, that's the stuff that I pulled for this discussion is Jennifer uh, demonstrated with her quick reporting. There's endless Leslie Headland's <laughs> quotes that, that yeah. we can find uh, on the Acolyte. So those are what we're looking at now. Uh, Ken, any final thoughts on the Acolyte? Been excited for the show. The day it was announced, uh, just intrigued by it and wasn't super familiar with Leslie Headland's work before that, though I, I uh, enjoyed uh, her 2015 rom-com Sleeping with Other People. I, I actually... Uh, Sudeikis and El Sabri, yeah. I, I, I like that film. Um, but now I'm all in on just what every interview she's she's given. I just really going back to Carrie Moss. I just think she gets it. I'm excited. I love the footage of celebration. I'm really excited about the trailer. Uh, without a doubt, because of the world and time we live in, this show's going to inspire some conversations, and not all of them good faith, and not all of them about Star Wars. But I'm ready here to weather that storm uh, and 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 do what we can to support the creators and people who are bringing us new Star Wars. Doesn't mean the show's going to be perfect, or that maybe maybe there's a disappointment. Of course, of course, we'll review it. We'll give our takes on it. But I just love that it exists, and I'm excited for something new. And I'm someone who's like, yeah, stormtroopers, rebels, love that. I could spend my whole life there. This is something new, and I'm. I'm excited about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I love shows that I know other people don't. The Book of Boba Fett didn't work for a lot of people. The uh, Obi-Wan uh -huh. Kenobi didn't work for a lot of people. I love those shows. I love legacy characters. But there's been so much discussion, I think, between uh, real in-the-bubble Star Wars fans, more casual Star Wars fans of, oh, when are they going to do something new? Right. <laughs> and I've always been like, Acolyte. Ac Acolyte's been announced, but it's not on really on people's radar, on the general public's radar. It's coming. Mm -hmm. I think it is going to be something really new. It looks really new from the trailer, as well as just playing within really established canon and ideas and lore of Star Wars and philosophy of Star Wars. So I'm so excited for it. Um, uh, like you said, Ken, the, the episodes will come out and, and we will give our honest takes and I'm sure there'll be some people who are just like, yeah, this isn't, uh, this is my cup of tea. I don't like it, whatever. And people want to share those thoughts in a polite and respectful way and comments. Great. There are also going to be some people who, who bring in anger and try to stop us from talking about this show, try to stop people from joy. This is a good one, two story uh, today to be like, uh, when it comes to act light, I'm going to choose joy. Like Daisy Ridley. I'm like, yep. There are going to be some people who have a problem that it exists. I am going to choose joy. This show is going to bring a lot of people about people joy. And whether we like it, love it, have qualms about it, we're going to talk about it in a joyful way and, and not be silenced. That's how I'm feeling about the Acolyte right now. Uh, Jennifer, what are any final thoughts from you? I am so excited for this for this series. Uh, I mean, her perspective, Leslie Headland's perspective as a director, I love her point of view. I love her point of view as a fan, uh, as a creator. Um, and I, like, for example, the Force Witch mother, Jodie Turner-Smith. When I saw that still, I was like, ah, this is what I've been waiting for. This is like the thing about pulling from the EU that is so smart because as we saw in the courtship of Princess Leia, there were other uh, witches, right? Other clans. And that was for me the problem with Ahsoka when we saw those night sisters, those witches, it felt, I don't want to say redundant, but I had an expectation. This is fresh. It's new. And yet it still is within the world of Star Wars. And that is what I'm looking forward to this show. It's just someone coming in with a lot of ideas. And I can't wait. Yeah. We got uh, witches. We got Wookiees. We got it all. I can't oh. wait to discuss it. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, Ken, you want to take us home? 
you know, anytime you mention the courtship of Princess Leia, a rancor gets their wigs. Ding! <laughs> All right. <laughs> we are the Force Center Podcast. We're on Twitter, Threads, Instagram, and even Hive. We'll, Hive, we'll see where else we end up uh, at Force Center Pod. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We're available on a lot of spots. We are a podcast in our heart, even though we're doing video. So podcasts out there on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. You can, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe if you'd like. Don't forget to check out our other videos. We got a ton of things in the catalog, including Jen's wonderful Jedi Beat episodes. Check the latest one out on the life and legacy Carrie Fishy. Fisher? Fishy? Fishy? Fisher. Uh, it's the end of the episode. That's when my tongue does not want to work anymore. Uh, Patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly. From there, you can get into our Discord and help us decide what movie commentary to do. Follow me at Ken Knapsack or go to my website, KenKnapsack.com for more. I do a live show on my own channel called The Blathering. Check it out weekly. Jen, where can they find you? You can find me on all the social media sites at Jennifer Landa or TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. Love it. Wonderful stuff, uh, Joseph. So uh, you're always on the move, unlike Kel Naka, who just wants to sit and relax or think and be by himself. <laughs> uh, I have my Kel Naka moments where I want to sit and be alone. But uh, anyway, Indeed. Uh, you can find me on social media and posting about that kind of stuff. Uh, my handle everywhere is at Joseph Grimshaw. I'm on Blue Sky, Threads, Mastodon, Instagram, all sorts of places. Uh, our short horror film, The Nightmare Adorable, is continuing to roll out. It's won some awards at uh, some more festivals. Uh, it's going to be at several festivals over the next couple of weekends. There's uh, uh, information on my website, josephsgrimshaw.com. But in particular, there's a horror convention in Seattle called Crypticon Seattle. And Nightmare Adorable is going to be playing at 9 o'clock on May 4th. Star Wars Day. Uh, I will be in Seattle for that screening. So if you're in Seattle and you want to go to that convention and check out uh, the film, I'll be there. So uh, if you're a Four Center uh, listener, watcher, uh, feel free to come and say hello at that screening. Uh, that is it, Ken. That is it. We'll see you all soon. For all the depressed Wookiees everywhere, we feel you. We got you. This was Four Center. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> 